Hi there, I'm Alan Smith and welcome to the show. Today we're going to talk about something that I think probably gets a mixed response from folks and that's this word called diet, right? Diet. Well, we all are familiar with the idea of diet, but we're going to explore some really fun and exciting ways to think about diets, all right? Number one is we're going to focus on the flexitarian diet. New word, right? Okay, so this comes from Dawn Jackson Blanter. She's a nutritionist who came up with this idea of being vegetarian but with just a little bit of animal product in the in in the in the meal and in, in, in what you consume. And the other part of this idea of flexitarian and diets is this idea of sustainable diets. Well what does a sustainable diet really mean? Well a sustainable diet is a diet that both is about our bodies and what we're eating, but also the environment. We want to make sure that we're selecting foods and the way those foods are produced that aren't impactful in a harmful way on the environment. And we also want to look for the best nutrition for us, uh, also not overeating. And thirdly, sustainable for me means, can I sustain the diet? Can I, can I carry through with it? Because the carry through with a diet is where you really see the results. We've got some exciting things coming up. We're going to talk about these gorgeous beauties in just a few minutes. Now, I want to be clear from the outset that the idea of the flexitarian diet isn't really rule driven. Uh, it's not about um, what you eat or don't eat or the uh, calories or the macronutrients. It's really more about a lifestyle and the way you think about food. Um, if you'd like to know more about flexitarian diets on my website, pallensmith.com, I've listed uh, lots of foods as well as recipes that you may want to check out. Now, one of my favorite foods, well, are the mushrooms. And just look at these, aren't they fantastic? Many of you may know mushrooms can be a great alternative for consuming meat. They're naturally high in protein and fiber, low in sodium, calories, fat, and cholesterol free. Replacing meat with mushrooms trims the amount of salt, calories, and fat while still feeling full and satisfied. Here with me today is Jess Wilkins. He's a farmer friend and neighbor, and he has a specialty in growing mushrooms. Um, and just look at the bounty here that he has brought from his farm for us to talk about today. Jess, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for inviting me on. Yeah, it's fantastic. These are just absolutely gorgeous. What I'd like to do is, is just talk about some of the varieties that you're growing. And then a little later, we'll talk about maybe some techniques for those who are interested in using mushrooms in their diet. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm just curious about this one because I'm, I'm just struck by the the very thick stalk of this one. Is this the king mushroom? That's the king oyster. The king oyster. So uh, why don't you describe the king oyster for those who, who've who never seen one of these? Sure, the king oyster is generally a, a pretty large mushroom as you can see. Very. And and the stem is actually choice on this mushroom. Like many, you would only eat the, the cap the and you cap throw the it. stem away. Yeah, yeah. But the stem is actually great. The, the, the cap is delicious on it as well. Right, right. But I can see that the, there's a lot of, of, of flesh, if you will, yeah. or meat on the stem here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. These are just absolutely gorgeous. Now, um, so this particular mushroom, is there, a, is there a particular way that you like to prepare this one? Yes, my favorite way would be to turn the stem into scallops. Ah, <laughs> like scallops from the sea. Yes, absolutely. Okay, nice, nice. Now, I, I'm struck by this these gorgeous clusters. This looks like a chestnut mushroom to me. Uh, it looks like little brown uh, little brown rolls that have yeah, just come, yeah, out, yeah. come out of the oven on stems, all clustered. I mean, there's probably here, what would you say, 40 or 50 little <laughs> mushrooms yeah, on the cluster? There's a lot. There's yeah, a lot. it's a village of mushrooms. Yeah. There is. yeah. It is just really, really beautiful. I, I mean, uh, I, I, I love the, the golden color just underneath the, the cap. And here, are, it, would you say that the stem and the cap and the base of this, uh, this basil plate is, is all edible? The stem is, is actually really good on this mushroom as well. They have mm -hmm. a very pleasing texture. So once again, you eat the whole mushroom. You, you would cut off this very bottom base here where there's a little bit of substrate left on there. Yeah, but, but yeah. The rest of the mushroom, there's no, no really texture change or favorability over one or the other. Are, are, there, are there any of these that you really like raw? 
I particularly don't like mushrooms raw. Mm, this uh, is good. I do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is good. That would be one. You know, like king oyster. You would definitely not want to eat raw. Mm. Uh, it's way too firm. I think the texture would be off on it. Uh, uh, so cooking it makes it much more palatable. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So this is the chestnut mushroom. So let's talk a little bit about uh, mushroom anatomy for a moment. So we've got the king mushroom that we've just described as this big thick stalk with a cap on it. But this one is, uh, you know, is a, there's a multiplicity of these little fruiting bodies here. So is there a name for these? I would just call it a cluster. A cluster, yeah. okay, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it makes sense, it's very descriptive. And moving on to clusters, these blue oysters are absolutely gorgeous. I mean, mm -hmm. that is pure art. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a very beautiful food. I mean, it just is unbelievable with the, the, the way the gills rise up from the stem and then create those gorgeous caps. And that is really a blue gray color to them. Yeah, when they're, when they're really young too, they're even more blue. They kind Are of they? fade as they mature. I and see. So if you let them over mature, they actually will fade out to gray. Oh, I see, I see. It, would this be um, in this state? And again, we've got we've got a cluster here of gosh, maybe thirty of these mushrooms coming out of this one base. What um, what is this the like the ideal time to to harvest a cluster like this? Yeah, it's, you want to wait. You don't want to let the cap completely invert. You know, to where it's more like a cup. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. By that point, the shelf life and the texture kind of wean on you. Yeah, um, yeah, right. I see. So these these are prone to the classic sort of flat top of the mushroom will begin to cup upward yeah, and, and yeah. almost creep a, a cup Yeah, you want to get them before they completely turn, turn mm -hmm, out. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. Now this one is the is a very odd, odd yeah. fellow for me and I don't know this one and I'm going to beg your, your uh, uh, knowledge on this. This looks like a snowball. Yeah. And it's a mushroom. Yeah, or a cauliflower. Or a cauliflower, <laughs> or maybe a pet ger gerbil or gremlin <laughs> or, or whatever they call those things on Star Trek, but a tribble. Uh, it's, it's really quite amazing. What, is, what do you call this mushroom? That is the lion's mane mushroom. The, of course. I've read about the lion's mane. And so I think that name actually comes when it matures, these teeth on it will actually grow really long. They get multiple uh, inches that's long. That's what I'm thinking. They're much more um, hairier yeah, looking, yeah. Yeah, hence the mane of exactly, the lion. Yeah. I see. So this is just a, a, a fairly immature form of the, yes, of the lion's yes, mane. Yes, it's when you would like, you know, prefer to harvest that Okay, one. so this is ideal harvest. My goodness, well, it is, it is beautiful. So how, let's talk just a moment about the the way in which you produce these mushrooms. I know a lot of folks love mushrooms. Uh, there are certain times of the year uh, here in, in Arkansas where people go out and, and look for chanterelles and uh, sure. morels and that kind of thing. But you're not, you're not a, a forager. You're actually a farmer and you're, you're growing yes. these. Yeah, so I have to grow them indoors because I grow one wood-loving mushrooms in, in cool mushrooms uh, in cool weather rather yeah well they're um, all cool <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so i have to regulate you know several uh, parts of their environment the humidity the light uh, keep co2 levels low and the temperature yeah yeah i like my co2 levels low <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's excellent so the um the is it, it do you get a 12 month out of the year harvest of all these or do the, is there a season for them? Absolutely. I can grow because I regulate those those conditions yes. in the you know extreme cold or the heat there's a little bit of challenge there you yeah. know as far as with the equipment My, and tweaking right. tweaking the Modulating environment a little bit environment. but I can produce them all year round. Yeah, that is that is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And you know one of the things uh, gardeners covet from mushroom growers, and we'll have to talk about this offline, is the, the mushroom compost. Yeah. So that is so good for the garden. Man, yeah, it, it is. It is great stuff. Uh, I mean, I get as, as excited about mushroom compost as I, I do just the use mushrooms the, themselves. Yeah, I just used a lot to start my garden. Uh, so we're gonna, it'll be my first year using it, so we'll, we'll 
see how it goes. Right. And so what is the base medium that you're growing these mushrooms uh, from? It's essentially hardwood. Okay. Uh, so I use sawdust for, it's just easier to work with uh, and you yep. can produce them faster on, on sawdust. Right. And does that sawdust need to be slightly decomposed or, or does it matter? No. Um, I would think that the nutrients need to be in that wood. I, I use basically fresh sawdust, okay. uh, not something that's already been decomposed by a, a competition to the mushroom. I see. Maybe another kind of mushroom. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah very right. well. Yeah. You know, mushrooms are fascinating because the if you if you're in the forest and you dig around and you see this white stuff, these like white veins, people may have seen yeah. just under the leaf or the um, the, the the mulch on the forest. Um, that is the mycelia right. that is under underground that will come up and emerge as one of these what's called a fruiting body. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's always fun fun to see these things when they when they when they emerge. In terms of varieties, what is, is this the full complement of what you're growing right now, Jess, or, or are there others? There, there. Are, I do have several more strains. These are my four favorite. Uh, what I would call my staples right now. Okay. Um, you know, they have a good variety of flavor and texture going on. That's yep. kind of why I chose Nice them. range. Yes, and yep. I've, I've figured out how to grow all of these particularly really well. Yeah. Um, there's maybe four or five other strains that I've experimented with, and and with my expansion now, I'll be able to offer more strains regularly. Yeah. Uh, some of them can take quite a bit, you know, quite a long time to grow, though. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, let's go back to that word strain for just a moment because, um, you know, I think all of us are sensitive about going out and foraging and harvesting the, the native or natural, uh, naturally producing mushrooms. Uh, but, but there's been a lot of work over the years uh, with mushroom and mushroom culture for commercial production. So you're using actual uh, commercial strains. Yes. Uh, so these, you know, have been dial down to more productive strains mm. and, that, and you there's a difference you know between species and the strain so like there could be different strains inside the blue oyster of course right um, yeah. so we see yeah. this with plants of all yeah. kinds yeah. yeah if you start from a spore certain presented certain percentage may not even produce mushrooms for you some will produce you know not very well some very well mm -hmm. so then you can clone and isolate that culture right uh, down to you know something the ones that's that are the really big yeah. producers yeah it's going to yeah. give you good results yeah excellent excellent um, you know I think mushrooms for a lot of folks are maybe a little scary you know it's like oh you know because we hear about you know they can be poisonous in yeah. the forest and that kind of thing uh, help me understand how you're seeing people kind of get over that uh, I guess Mike. Myco, mycophobia, yeah, would that be correct. what it's called? Yes. Uh, yeah, mycology, the study of mushrooms, and phobia, the fear. So, yeah. I think that, you know, people are, there's more knowledge coming out with it, and they're just becoming a more popular thing. So, yeah, you know, the totally. more information and the more people and the more they read and see them, they just feel more comfortable with them. Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> think so. Um, and are there particular varieties that you see that people reach for or recoil from because of just their appearance? I mean, like the lion's mane. It looks like a big yeah. cauliflower, so is, and it looks like it could be a pet. Yeah, absolutely. You know? <laughs> More so, I think, you know, from the culinary standpoint, if they don't know how to prepare the mushroom, they're not as comfortable. Yeah, with, that with makes a lot it. of sense. Sure. You know, it's the, like the chestnut is one of the the bigger, you know, the hot sellers, and it's it looks it's identifiable as a mushroom. Yeah. And the preparation techniques are, are fairly simple. Sure. With it. Sure. Yeah, I could I could see that. So. The closer it looks to a classic mushroom, yeah, yeah. the comfort level goes up. Yes. And then if you can uh, understand some cooking techniques with them, then again, you, you feel a little closer yeah. to the shroom. Yeah, yeah. Right. okay, awesome, awesome. So Jess, what I would really like to do, if, if, if it's all right with you, I would love for you to walk us through maybe some of the cooking techniques because uh, these four represent a wide range of what you can find out there in the way of mushrooms yeah. in terms of their morphology, their shape, and so forth, and as you mentioned, flavor and texture. And um, I think that would really be fascinating, uh, not only for me, but also for our audience. I'd, I'd love to show you a couple ways. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's shift some things around here and get started. Okay, sounds good. Now let's put some of these mushrooms to work here in the kitchen. 
Um, all right, so Jess, which one do you want to start with and help us with some techniques with some of these things? Sure, let's start with the king oyster, my favorite mushroom. Right, yep. So there's you two ways that. I like to prepare this, which is to scallop the stem. You can also shred it into pulled pork. Ah, so you can make it look like a scallop. Absolutely. So here we go. All right, there's, there's a scallop, looks like about very nice scallop. Any thickness, you can go any yeah, way you want. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, look at that. Look and at the, those the, gorgeous the, scallops. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what would you do with the cap? So here we have, we've taken the stem, it looks like scallops, and then you've got that beautiful, beautiful cap. I would treat it just the same we're going to do with this with this stem, as it's, it's equally delicious. Okay. All and right. from this point, you can take these and steep them in hot water, and that helps that texture, but it's not a must. You don't have to. Okay. So uh, if you get up, if you get, it, would this go across the board if you've got a mushroom that, that has a little tough, or tougher texture? Uh, maybe blanch it in some hot water first. Sure. Is that helpful? Yeah, sure. Okay. Now I want to let's take another king for just a moment, okay. and I want I want that shredded pork. I want to see what you All do right. with that. So here we are. We've got the stem. Yeah, and uh, I'll just take that. You scar take it. A fork, and you're just scarring it on the. Yeah, look at that. Okay, you're just tearing it into it into shreds, so it it does look like shredded pork. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Whoop. Huh. <laughs> so you're you're drawing the 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 fork down across the stem. Yeah, and, and that's, that's just it. to get the texture going right here. And you're going all the way up into the up into the the cap and the, and the gills, and you're shredding all of it. Yeah, just that's so easily done. Look at that, and it does look like shredded pork. Yeah. And then nice. from this point, I like to take it and kind of bake it for like ten minutes. Or just to, depends, you know, how much mushroom you have, but just to pull a little bit of that moisture out, okay, and then give it a quick saute. Okay, so that would dry it out a little bit. Yeah, just pull some moisture out. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Could could you just let it maybe sit on the cutting board like this for a little while? I, I haven't tried that. I don't yeah. know how well that would work. Okay. Or not. Well, I'm. You know, you never know when you've got to go check a phone call yeah. or whatever. So we've got. So here we've got shredded pork and we've got scallops. Absolutely. From one mushroom. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Now. Uh, I want to get something started over here. Why don't okay. we do the um, Why don't we do this shredded pork, okay. um, as it were, over here? And I'm gonna I'm gonna use olive oil um, now because we're doing flexitarian. So I could use butter, Absolutely. right? Right. So what I tend to do, and I'm I'm curious about what you think about mushrooms. Um, I love the flavor of them, and I don't like a lot of seasoning. Um, Personally, um, so like with this, do you have any? When you do the shredded pork, do you have herbs or, or flavors that you like to add to the mushroom, or do you like the, for the flavor of the um, the king just to stand out in itself? The flavor of the the king oyster kind of tastes more like meat almost right out of the gate already. Mm -hmm. It doesn't right. have that typical mushroom flavor to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, with the pulled pork, you could also just slap barbecue sauce on it and make <laughs> yeah. a pulled pork sandwich. There uh, you go. Yeah, yeah. I would think maybe um, what I tend to do is just a little garlic, maybe and yeah. salt yeah. and pepper. Yeah, and keep it simple. Maybe a little thyme that would fresh thyme out of the garden. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, this is really shaping up nicely. And is there a point at which you go, okay, this is done, or is it just to, once it's tender enough for um, however you want to prepare yeah, it? Yeah, I would just kind of wait until it kind of browns a little maybe, or until it just, yeah, the texture softens up a little right. bit. Because it's okay. a, such a firm mushroom. Sure. Now the lion's mane, that really has me intrigued what you would do with the lion's mane. So let's talk about that while I just continue. Sure. To, so yeah. lion's mane, I like to take and slice it almost into like half inch discs. Okay, uh, like you, you might have cauliflower. Yeah, and you don't even have to do that. You can also just pull it almost like you would chicken, and it'll get get a look like pulled chicken. Mm -hmm. uh, and with lion's mane, I actually like to dry saute it. Yeah, and how does it taste raw? It's pretty good. It's kind of like a clean flavor. It's very clean. Yeah. Ooh, that's nice. Yeah. Oh, it's got a really good sort of after after flavor. After taste, yeah. And nice. then when you dry saute it, I like to do that as opposed to starting with a bunch of butter or oil in the pan. Uh, okay. Because uh, it really is like a sponge and it will soak that up. Okay. And if you dry saute it, it kind of gives it more of a flake crab meat texture to it. Okay. And then you already have that clean flavor, so you can make, use it as a crab substitute. Really? Yeah. Okay. That's a nice idea as well. Beautiful. Beautiful. And that's got great flavor. All right, let's jump over here if we could to the um, our 
our uh, chestnut mushrooms. Sure. And uh, just a couple of tips on that would be really helpful. So, Those are so beautiful. Yeah, and, and the chestnut mushroom is somewhat of a mild flavored mushroom. Uh, it's not super strong, but it has an amazing texture to it. And what I really like is, is it doesn't get rubbery on you no matter how you prepare it. You can't cook it wrong. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the stem is, is really good on these as well. So all you'd want to do with these is just cut that base ba off of there. Base, right. Where you have all these good little mushrooms. And I like yeah. to keep them whole. It's one of, I think, the better qualities of them. Whatever. Oh, they look good on the plate. Yeah, they, they present really well. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They hold up well. Absolutely. Okay. You know, it doesn't okay. get lost in your dish. It goes great in an omelet. Oh, look, oh yeah, that sounds like a wonderful idea. This is the one I was trying raw. I, I think it's got wonderful flavor. Mm. Yeah, it's good. And you can see I like to graze. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now let's talk about shelf life. Um, give, give us a range, if we throw these in the fridge, is that the best way to keep them? I like to keep them in a paper sack. Paper sack. And then put them in, in the fridge, absolutely. You want to keep them cold. Okay, the keep idea to storing a mushroom is to slowly dry it out. You know, if you if you have it in a plastic bag, it, yeah. it's going to keep that moisture yeah, in there right. and it'll essentially rot faster. Sure, uh, it, as any vegetable will, yeah. And then if you leave it just open in your fridge with the fan blowing on it, you're really fastly drying it. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Very good. Well, Jess, this is fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time from your busy day growing these mushrooms to come up here to Moss Mountain Farm. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, keep up the good work yeah, with uh, Y Mountain Mushroom Farms. Yeah, <laughs> this is awesome. Cool. I hope you've enjoyed our show on the flexitarian diet and the benefits it has for both us and for the environment. You know, I think that we could all eat a little less and be a little more conscious about what we're eating and how it's grown. You can find the replay of this podcast on our YouTube channel. I hope you'll subscribe and be a regular viewer as well as um, like what you see and also add comments. We love to respond to your comments and follow us on our other social media platforms, Facebook and Instagram. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith. Hey, if you like this video, comment below and subscribe to my channel.